Well, some, some days have a special meaning throughout the week. You know, Sunday is very special to us, of course, but uh, for some people, Tuesday is, is Taco Day, Taco Tuesday, and Friday is Fajita Friday. And I get an email every Thursday. It's called Thursday 321. And it's an email by an author named James Clear. James Clear wrote a great book on developing habits called Atomic Habits, how little habits can have a, a big impact in your life. And he shares uh, every week on Thursday this 321, three ideas, two quotes from books he's read, and one question to think about. And this week, I thought the question was very appropriate. His question was this, what can you remove from your plate so you can put on your plate what's most important? His recommendation is that instead of taking this list of all the things we have to do, kind of like our to-do list, and then prioritizing everything, he said, just, just wipe it all clean. Just wipe it all clean. Don't even look at that list. Ask yourself, what are the most important things I should be doing with my life? And make sure those get on the plate. And we've been um, looking at this series called Endgame because th the point is there are some things that are more important than other things in our lives. And there's a verse in Scripture that really makes this so clear. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. In the New International Version, the Apostle Paul says it this way, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith love. If you could put two things on your plate, it would be faith and love. And it's interesting that when, when we look at all the myriad of things we have to do and we get overwhelmed by it, how when there's a limitation, we, we make quicker decisions. For example, if you've got a little suitcase and you're packing for a trip and you realize I've got all this stuff on the bed to fit in the suitcase and it won't fit in the suitcase. So those shoes aren't going to go, those pants won't go, those shirts don't go, I can't take those things because they won't fit, and you quickly make the decisions because the trip's coming up, you've got to decide something, and you only can take that bag, and you make the decision. I think the same thing happens with time. If you are told by your doctor, you have three months to live, there'd be projects on your to-do list that you'd say, you know what, I'm not even going to touch that. That's never going to happen. In fact, what may happen is you would bring into focus things that weren't even on your to-do list, like people that you've, uh, that you've not talked to for a while, or people you need to restore relationship with, people that you love you need to spend time with, uh, your spouse, your kids. All of a sudden, those would be the things on your plate, right? And all this other stuff would be sitting out here left undone, and you're okay with that because this is what's most important. And what I want to challenge you to do is, is clear your plate and say, what's most important? What will develop my faith deeper with the Lord, and what will enable me to love people in greater ways? What do I need to be doing in those two areas, faith and love? Because that's what it boils down to. And we've been talking about faith for several weeks, and then last week, Pastor Sam helped turn the corner or transition us, saying that faith, if it's real, genuine faith, will produce love. You can say all you want, I have faith. But people look at us and say, I'll, I'll, I'll determine your faith by the way you act toward the people around you. Uh, faith is evidenced by love. And so those two work together beautifully. They're so intertwined. In fact, the closer you get to God in faith, the, the more natural love becomes because God is love. And you can't have God filling your life without becoming like God, becoming a loving person. If your faith is making you um, uh, difficult to be around other people, is giving you a, a judgmental spirit around other people, is making you look down on other people, causing you to withdraw from other people, then something's wrong with your faith. Because real faith, if it's faith in Jesus, the greatest lover there's ever been, will cause us to love people like he loves. And what happens, this is a beautiful dance that happens, when, when you exhibit, when you have faith in, in the Lord and it causes you to love that love then compels other people to believe in God. Those that receive love are compelled to believe. For example, if I, love, if I trust the Lord and believe God is leading me to love a person, the person that receives the love in turn says, you know what, I think there's a God who loves me. And they start to trust the God who, who has shown them love. And so that's this beautiful dance. We trust the Lord. We give love. People receive love. And because of the love they receive, they put their trust in the Lord. And so that's this dance that we want to happen in our lives. But God, uh, as much as he loves the whole world, draws special attention to certain groups within Scripture. Not that they're more valuable than other people. Uh, it's because they often get neglected. They often get overlooked. 
And he draws special attention to say, hey, make sure you love these people. It's very important. And I want to draw your attention to four groups of people that the Lord uh, tells us we need to make sure we're loving. The first are lost people. Lost people. New York Times uh, had an article several years ago called, Why Don't Men Ask Directions? And the response was in the headline is, they don't feel lost. That's probably true. Most of us guys are pretty stubborn. Like, I'm not lost. Uh, We're going to get there. I'm just taking the long way, but we are going to get there. I'm not going to ask for help. I don't feel lost. And men and women, the article says, look at um, directions differently for the most part. This isn't always true, but it said generally women will have markers, identifiable markers saying, go down to the blue house, take a right, go to the fire station, take a left. Men will say, you know, you go about five miles, come to a road, take a left, go about three minutes, and then take a right on the dirt road. And we, we talk spatially when we, when we look at directions. But the real truth is whether men or women, oftentimes we don't recognize that we're lost. I look back at my life before I was a Christian, I never called myself lost. It's a church term. Unchurched people don't go around saying, man, I'm so lost. You know, you may come to church at a point in life where you actually feel lost, and it's only when you feel lost that you start to recognize the need for God in your life. But it definitely is a very churchy word, and it's not a bad word. It's just a word that Jesus used to describe people that are far from God. For example, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus was trying to communicate to the to the Pharisees and religious leaders, why he was spending so much time with tax collectors and prostitutes and people who are far from God. And Jesus told them this parable. He said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And Jesus went on and told another parable. Well, no, we won't read it, but it's a parable of a woman who had a coin that disappeared. She lost a coin, and she searched the house until she found it. And then he tells a story of a boy that wandered off from his father, called the prodigal son, but it's really the story of the lost son, and how he came back home and was found. And all these parables say the same thing. There is, there is something of value that's been separated, and the owner is looking for it. And so Jesus is saying, God the Father looks at people who are far from God and says they're lost and they need to be brought back into the fold. They need to be brought back into the household. And that's how he looks at lost people. And so Jesus spent his ministry not only telling Jewish people that he had come, they fulfilled the prophecies, but he went to Gentiles who are kind of the, the ones left out and says, he's here for you too. And the Samaritans, as Sam said, they were really hated people. He came for you too. He came for everybody. Why? Because God loves everybody. And here's what you need to know, because some of you may be visiting church today. There's nothing you have done in your life that's so horrible that would turn God against you. There's nothing. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In, in the midst of our sin and, and how horrible our sin, how, how deep our rebellious hearts have been, it doesn't matter. God says, I still loved you in spite of all that. I love you so much, I was willing to send my one and only son for you. So you just need to know, if that's you, and whether you felt lost or not when you walked in here today, God does love you. And every Sunday at the end of the service, we give a time that you can come forward to acknowledge that you love him in return, and you want to be forgiven. See, sin, sin erects a barrier between us and God, but through the cross, Jesus removes that barrier and says it's free. You can come home now. But we have to trust in him. We have to kind of leave that life of sin and say, I'm going to trust you with my life. And if that's you, whether it's this Sunday or another Sunday, uh, feel welcome to come to the front and just acknowledge, that's me. I want God to find me today. He's been looking for you. He's been searching for you because he cares about lost people, and he wants us to care about lost people. Several years ago, uh, my family, when we lived in Arizona, we were driving up through New Mexico, and we went through, it was dark outside, and the family just, they fall asleep when it gets dark. So I'm driving by myself, went through uh, Albuquerque, went through Santa Fe, and I'm just driving, listening to music, and all of a sudden I see a sign that says Las Vegas. I went, oh my goodness, what happened? Did I, where did I, where did I turn wrong? I'm getting really panicked now, and everyone's sleeping, I'm afraid to wake my wife up and tell her what's happened, but we're on our way to Las Vegas. And I don't know what to do, but I just keep driving. I says, there's got to be some mistake. It can't be right because Las Vegas is the other way. But I don't remember going the other way. And it seems like it should be a lot longer than this. 
And then I went further, another sign. I'm seeing, I don't see any glowing lights on the horizon from everything I know about Las Vegas. There should be lights and billboards. There's none of that. And then I realized there's another city called Las Vegas. So I breathed a sigh of relief. You know, at that moment, though, I, I thought, I'm lost. Oh, my goodness, how did I get here? And sometimes it feels like that. And, and oftentimes lost people have this awakening, and it's our job to let them know God's been looking for you. Paul writes about this in his letter to the Corinthian church. He says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. For Christ's love compels us. Get that. Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Our motivation isn't to get stickers in heaven for winning lost people. Our motivation for sharing Christ with people is is love. We love lost people. You know, I didn't love lost people before I became a Christian. Again, I didn't really know who lost people were. But I would just honestly say, I I cared nothing about lost people before I became a Christian. But since I've been been a Christian and walk with Jesus, I have this achiness in my heart for family members that don't know the Lord, for kids I went to school with who don't know the Lord, for neighbors who don't know the Lord, for people in other countries that don't know the Lord. And it should be the love of God that prompts us to want to reach out. One of the things I love about this Ted Cunningham event, and I really want to encourage you, is If you ever wanted to get a friend to come to church and they won't come on Sunday morning, they will come to a comedy night. They will. And they'll they'll probably even come to a parenting seminar because those are real issues. Marriage, family issues are very real to them. And so take advantage of this opportunity. It's not just for our church. It's for the community. And and it could be the, the, the foot in the front door, the side door, in a sense, into the church to feel like, hey, this, this isn't such a bad place after all. We have side doors all through the week from women's ministries to celebrate recovery to well care classes, uh, re-engage. All those are, are avenues to which we might be able to get someone to put a foot in the door and to say, you know what? These people are pretty normal after all. And then take the next step in. And then eventually maybe come on a Sunday morning and hopefully at some point give their life to Jesus Christ. God loves lost people. We should too. Secondly, he loves little people. Now, I'm not talking stature, though he loves little people. I'm talking about children. Dwight L. Moody, who was one of the famous evangelists of the 1800s, came home from a revival meeting, and his wife said, so, how did it go? He said, well, it was a, it was a good night for two and a half conversions. She thought about that for a while. She said, oh, that's, that's sweet. Two adults and a child. How old was that child? He said, oh, no, no, got it wrong. That was two children and one adult. See, those kids have their whole life in front of them. That adult, he's already lived half his life. Sometimes we underestimate the importance of reaching children when they're young, when they have a whole life in front of them. And you know what I found? This is one of the lessons God ingrained in me when I was a children's pastor is children have a lot to teach us about the simplicity of faith. I mean, Jesus knew this. And that's why when he was training these church leaders, his disciples, who were going to take on the church leadership for the, for the first century, he said, guys, time out. Hey, little, little, little one, come over here. Brought a little child in the midst of the disciples. And here's what Jesus did. He called the, called the little child to him and placed the child among them. When I say little child, I'm thinking this is probably three-year-old, five-year-old. It's little, little child. Because a teenager in their culture was virtually an adult. So a little child. And he says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Get that last line. How you treat those children is how you treat me. You welcome them, you welcome me. See, in most cultures, children are, are marginalized and victimized. If you look at cultures where there's been famine, you know who are the, the most likely to die? It's the children. You, when disease breaks out, you know the, who suffers the most? It's the children. When there's war, you know who suffers the most? It's the children. Uh, I don't know if it's true to this day, but 10 years ago, statistics said that, that over 50% of casualties in war were children. 
It's the children who go play in the, in the fields not knowing there's landmines still in existence there. It's children who get trafficked in the sex trade. It's children who are hurt the most when a couple divorces. And the, in most cultures, we look at children and say, but they don't contribute much. They're, they're not producers. They're just consumers. But I want to challenge you on that in that children give us something that oftentimes adults don't give. I mean, you have a child, exactly, unconditional. If you have a child come up and wrap their arms around your leg, it's such a cool experience. You get a little, little child giving you a sloppy kiss on the cheek or the lips, or you get a piece of homemade artwork that resembles a Rembrandt, and you, and you place it on your refrigerator proudly. I mean, it's priceless. It's priceless. What our kids do for us can't be measured in monetary terms. And so Jesus is very countercultural because in the Roman and Greek culture of his day, children, children were like uh, not to be seen and heard. And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to put them center stage. I'm going to put them on a stand, and you're going to look at this child, and I'm going to tell you, unless you become like that child, you ain't making it. That's a bold statement. Unless you become like that child, I thought the child was supposed to become like us. We're the disciples. No. There's something that child possesses. See, children are so remarkable because, when, you know, I used to look down on children. I thought they were sloppy, messy, stinky, all that kind of stuff. And I started working with kids, and I said, you know what? Kids, when they're young, have this, like, readiness to believe in God. Just like, I don't doubt there's a God. They pray openly. They pray like God's right there. It's when we've been trained not to believe in God or we've been indoctrinated that there, there is no God, that we start to question, we struggle with it. You get children looking at the world and say, there's a God that made that. They don't have a problem with it. You look at beautiful things, someone made those beautiful things. You look at the beautiful trees, beautiful mountains, beautiful sky. Well, obviously somebody made that. Well, God made that. Oh, that makes perfect sense to a child. Children are like clay. You can mold their hearts and mold their minds when they're little very easily. But once they harden... It is extremely difficult to remold that. When you get children when they're young, they're far more willing to accept the Lord into their life. You wait until they get to be 20, 30, 40 years old, the, the percentages go way down. The likelihood they'll give their life to Christ goes way down because they put up barriers. But we need to get kids when they're young. And I just want to affirm any of you in this room who have in the past or currently are working with our next-gen students and our children uh, you are doing a remarkable job. When you sit down in a circle with a group of kids and you're applying the scriptures to their lives, or if you're investing your heart and soul into telling a Bible story in a creative way so those preschoolers' eyes light up when they hear the incredible things that God has done, or you change the diaper of a crying child and then rock him to sleep, Jesus says, you did all that for me. What you did for that child, you did for me. It's like... That's baby Jesus you're holding. That's toddler Jesus you're teaching. That's middle schooler Jesus, believe it or not, that you're talking to. He says, when you've done it to them, you've done it to me. He said, you should be so pleased with, with being involved in that ministry. You should feel so privileged because Jesus says, when you do it for them, you're doing it for me. It's a beautiful thing. But there's also a warning in this passage. Jesus goes on to tell his disciples, if anyone causes one of these little ones... Those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. There's going to be a price to pay for those that take advantage of our kids, for those that exploit the children through media, through movies, through fear, through sex. Jesus, if you cause these little ones to stumble, it's not going to bode well for you. You know, I, my heart breaks every time I see an Amber Alert. Every time I hear another story of some trusted public official who's been found to either have abused kids or is in possession of child pornography. You know, I, I cringe when I hear domestic violence cases where a child got caught in the crossfire and suffered, sometimes fatally, because of it. I think those are ones that Jesus gave, entrusted to us to teach the wonders of God and the truths. They're not going to get that opportunity. 
But it's not just out there in the world where the fear is. I have to say that a lot of the danger is right in our homes. When I was a children's pastor, I was shocked that I would have kids come on Sunday morning and tell me, Pastor, I was watching Freddy Krueger with my parents the other night. I said, that's an R-rated movie, and you're in third grade. Why are you watching that movie? Oh, my brother and I watch those with mom all the time. I said, and your parents are Christian. Wow. Kids will speak vulgar words, you know, profane words, the foulest words, the F word, the B words, you know, all those words they're using. They go, where did you learn that? My mom and dad. So you've got to be kidding me. Sometimes home can be the most dangerous place. Our kids are watching, and our kids are imitating us. They are learning by our example. That's why it's so critical that we guide them in the right way. We, we need to take advantage of the opportunities that God has given for us to learn to be better parents. That's why this parenting seminar is so critical. We've got to do it well. And there are issues that are hard and they're difficult. And society's made it, made it extra challenging. With sexuality issues and social media things that we don't even know how to deal with because we didn't deal with it when we were kids. And we want to help you and equip you, whether you're a parent or leader, grandparent, caregiver with kids. Jesus ended his discussion with his disciples and said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. It's like these kids have special contact with God through the angels. Don't mess with them. Love the little ones. Then Jesus goes on and talks about loving those who are least. Uh, Least in the sense of maybe least valued in our culture might be a least resource. They just don't have... The resources might be uh, least opportunities, might be least in voice. They're just in a position where they don't have what other people have. And Jesus told a, a memorable parable about a king who divided his, his um, citizens in two groups. One was called the sheep and one was called the goats. And what, what defined who were the sheep and who were the goats was decided by how they treated the least of these And the least of these are people who were in prison, people who were sick, people who uh, didn't have food or drink, didn't have clothing, how you treated those people. And so so Jesus talks to those that are the sheep, and he he tells about what they did and how they went about helping those people and visited those people and gave to those people. And he said to them and affirmed them in a very big way. He says this in, in this parable, the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? And feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. There it is again. How you treated these people is how you're treating me. And the kind of cool thing was these people had just made it such a normal part of their lifestyle that they actually didn't even realize they were doing it for Jesus. And yet Jesus says, you were. You didn't even know it, but you were. And if you go on to that story, those that were the goats said, Jesus, if we'd known it was you, we would have helped you. And he goes, truth is, it was me and those people, and you didn't help. And when you didn't do it for them, you didn't do it for me. See, when we help people in need, when we help people who are disadvantaged, he says, you are doing it to me. I'm so glad that for uh, about 15 years, our church has had a group of dedicated volunteers. It's all volunteer. They get in cars on Wednesday night. They make a drive down to Pueblo to the youthful offender system. And they, uh, yep, there's one of them over there. Her husband's over there. And, and they go down, and they hardly miss a Wednesday night all through the year. They don't, they don't take breaks for the summer or spring break or Christmas. They're there every, virtually every Wednesday night. And they communicate to these young men and women who've made some bad decisions in their lives, God still loves you. God still has a plan for your life. You have a lot of years in front of you if you surrender your life and walk with him. Not, not, not everyone does, but I'll tell you this. Over the last several years, there have been dozens of men and even some women now who've dedicated their lives to following Jesus Christ. In fact, last month in September, 14 people were baptized Amen. because of this group going down and saying, we love those people. We love those people. What are you getting out of it? What are you, get, what are you getting out of dedicating four hours every Wednesday night to those, those losers down there? No, they're not losers. Those are people Jesus loves. Yes. 
And they need to know that. And that's why we go there every Wednesday night. We have a man in our church named Andy LaValle. Andy works here in, in this community. And we support him as a church. And Andy is the executive director of, uh, in Colorado of Youth for Christ. A group of, he oversees a group of volunteers that goes into the prison system here in Colorado Springs to visit juveniles, children, in, sometimes middle schoolers who are in prison. And, and helps equip these volunteers to go into the prisons on a regular basis to tell those people, your life isn't over just because you made some bad choices. God still loves you. See, I don't think Jesus' list necessarily is exhaustive in that these are the, you know, six categories, you know, because there's homeless people all around us. And you've done it to them, you've done it to me, Jesus says. Another group that's not listed there, but I think Jesus would categorize there, are those with special needs. That God loves those with special needs. But sometimes they're least advantaged. They don't have the resources. They don't have the opportunities. And that's why I'm so glad that every February, this will be the sixth year coming this, in 2020, we will, we will be offering Night to Shine. An event that's kind of a prom-like event for special needs individuals and for these kids. I already got a, a, a Facebook message from somebody this week already communicating, getting excited about what's to come with Night to Shine, and that's just three months away. And some of you have been part of it. You volunteer. You know how wonderful it feels to love those, and, and some of you have never had that experience. I want to encourage you, when, when the doors open to volunteer, it's going to be back here in our own campus in February. You should sign up to be part of it. It's, it's life-changing. It feels so good to love someone just because of God loving you and loving them through you. So God loves the lost people, he loves the little people, he loves the least people, and he loves the lonely people. In James chapter 1, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. In biblical times, and this is true of the cultures even predating the New Testament, when someone was orphaned, they, they really had no rights. You, you had no guardians to protect you. Uh, if you were a widow, as we saw in that parable of the, the widow that went to the judge, I don't have a husband to fend for me, and I'm a nobody now. And so widows and orphans often were just overlooked in society. Sometimes they were just left to die. And so God comes along, and you see, you see this even back in the Old Testament. He tells his people, hey, look out for the orphans. And the widows, and he even adds the aliens, the foreigners, the immigrants, those that are coming in. Because they, they, they all feel the sense of loneliness. They all are wondering, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Because my connection and belonging is gone. Where do I fit in here? And God says, you fit in my church. Everybody has a place within my church family. And so we are called as Christians to care for those, um, care for the orphans, care for the widows, care for the lonely. Some of you remember um, one of our leaders named Todd Musgrave. Todd used to lead our uh, annual trip down to Mexico with his wife, Debbie. They'd get a team together, and they'd go down to Ninos de Baja, this orphanage down in Mexico. And some of you don't know this, but the reason that was so dear to Todd was Todd was an orphan himself. And there was a Christian family that adopted him when he was just a little one. And every time he went down there, he saw kids that were a lot like him. And he wanted to make sure that they were loved by our church. See, we get an opportunity to love those that are lonely. Did you know that sitting around you even today, there's probably someone who's lost their spouse, who's gone through a divorce, or who's a single parent struggling to make ends meet, and they're deeply lonely. And you sit right around them in church, and sometimes you don't even know it, and yet they're here. And they feel a sense of connection here at the church. But I'll tell you this. Oftentimes they come in and they go out and nobody's given them a hug. Nobody's asked them how they're doing. Nobody's asked them if there's any needs that they have. And we have an obligation as a church family to love those who are lonely, to reach out to those. I'd encourage you, even before you leave today, that maybe you look around and see someone and just get to know them, give them a hug, and even ask, how are you doing? How are you doing? Because there are struggles and very real struggles in people's lives. I remember a, a pastor, my, um, my son-in-law attended a church in California years ago, and my, he married my daughter, and they went to church in Chico, California. He gave me a book by the pastor of the church he attended. And this pastor, when he was, when he was younger in ministry, his church was growing, he was very busy, but his wife was diagnosed with hypoglycemia. And so he would go to church early in the morning, and about 9 o'clock he would go home, 
and he would make breakfast for his wife. And they would have this hour together where, where he'd cook some eggs, make some toast, make some coffee, and sit down with her. And, and that was good for a while, but over the course of months, he said he was getting really tired of it. It, was, it, was, it had become a real burden. He kept thinking, like, why can't she make her own breakfast? Why can't she do this for herself? And one day he was, he was standing at the stove, and he cracked the eggs in the pan, and he was mixing them, and he heard this unmistakable voice say to him, Jesus came to breakfast today. He said, really? He turns around and he sees his wife at the table. He says, I get it, Lord. He said, it, it totally transformed his attitude in caring for his wife. Because when he loved his wife, he was loving Jesus. See, the whole point of all this is, is when you love people who are lost, who are little, uh, who are the least, who are lonely, you are doing it for the Lord. He is love. He wants us to love those that he loves. And this incredible thing happens. When you love someone, they're touched, and they're more apt to put their trust in the Lord. A year and a half ago, I got to go to Ecuador for distribution of the Operation Christmas Child boxes. I always thought they got distributed at Christmas. I was wrong. They can't get them all out on Christmas. So this was at the end of January. And we went into some villages in Ecuador, and we had these big events where kids got to receive these shoe boxes and open them up. And I'll never forget the story. One of the other pastors came back to our nightly meeting and shared with the rest of the group. He said that he was at a distribution, and a little boy got his box and opened it up and started pulling the things out. He pulled out a little car, and he looked at his mom, and he started to cry. And the, and the pastor thought, like, oh, my goodness. Did he, why, why is he so upset? Why, why is he so disappointed? And so um, this pastor was Hispanic, and he was able to speak to this Ecuadorian mother and said, what, what just happened? Why, why is your son so sad? And he goes, oh, he's not sad. For weeks, he'd been praying for this day that, that in his box, he would get a car. And he said, Mom, look, God heard my prayer. And see, so you never know when your act of love is someone else's answer to prayer. Because I really believe the way God loves people on this earth is through people like us, his, his church. And when you send a shoebox, when you visit an elderly person in a nursing home, when you love a child, when you put your arm around and hug someone who's disabled and say, God loves you, Jesus says, you are expressing my love. You are my hands. You are my feet. You're my voice through whom I speak. And I want to ask you, would you be willing, if you're a believer in Jesus, to let God make you into a lover? I want to invite everybody to stand. So we're going to sing a song, which is just a commitment. God, I want to be like that. I want to be a person who builds my life on love, that I not only receive love, but I give it. But I also want to recognize the fact there are some here today who find themselves in a place in life where you said, Pastor, I'm that lost person. I didn't know God loves me like that. And I want to invite you as we sing to come up. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to be available. If you'd be available up front, we just want to pray for you. We want to communicate to you, God really does love you. He's got a beautiful plan for your life in the years ahead. For some of you that may be lonely, maybe you need a prayer over you today. If you're a child, I just want you to know you are so welcome here. I know there's a lot of adults around. We're big people, but you are so welcome here. We love the fact that you're in this church. And for some of you who struggle with different issues in your life, maybe you feel like, I'm, I feel like the least sometimes. I'm the least popular. I'm the least resourced. I have the least opportunities. God loves people in their weakness through whom he can show his strength. And so you come forward. Let our prayer team just pray over you and strengthen you lift you up before the Lord. And for the rest of us, would you, would you just open yourself to, to become a person of love? Father, thank you for the opportunity we have right now to open ourselves to your love. You love us deeply. And Lord, we believe in you and we want to be lovers like you. Fill us, fill us to the full that when we, we see another person, we see them through the eyes of Christ as you do. And Lord, we wouldn't just feel something for them, we would do something for them. We would speak a word, we would, we would be generous, we would, we would do something to communicate your love to them. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's dedicate ourselves to love. And if you are in a place of, need, of needing love today, come up so we can pray for you.